Uh, hi everybody. Um, so welcome to this class. Before we uh, go into the meat of uh, the lectures, which is going to be a lot of essentially support vector machines, generalized linear models, a few administrative things. So the solutions will be available tomorrow uh, with point marks and all that, so we can cross check it, and then you'll also get new problems. So sorry for the delay. Um, a, you'll still get the five problem sets that you'll get uh, over the entire class, so don't worry about it. Um, the midterm projects, uh, the presentations are on March 13. I think I told some March 20, but March 13 it is. That gives you about three weeks from now to come up with a decent presentation of essentially what you're going to do, why it's actually an interesting problem to work on, um, and that can be something like, well, look, you can get some very deep insight. It could also be simply, well, I want to get rid of which, right? That's, okay. If that's the important thing in your life, that's what you want to go for. Um, it's a good idea to give some idea of, you know, what you've actually managed to achieve so far. And this is important because that will also, you know, convince, will allow you to convince yourself and everybody else that, it's actually possible to do what you're aiming for. And you have 10 minutes. Um, you get six slides maximum. So that means you're not going to waste too much time on your slides. That's important. And supporting documentation up to 10 pages, which can describe whatever things in that context that you'll be looking at. So the other point is simply to sustain you know, one and a half weeks before the spring break. And that will ensure that, you know, before spring break, you will have pretty much set down on what you're going to do, have a little bit of a plan such that you can use all of spring break to work on the project, right, rather than go to the beach. Um, or you can work on that on the beach, something like that. So, um, yeah, we're going to do generalized linear models. So what we're going to do more specifically is we're going to look at the kernel trick talk about a few rather simple kernels, just as a brief warm-up. We'll revisit a lot of those things next uh, week, uh, but just such that you have a bit of a working idea of you know, what the kernel means, we'll look at all the mathematical properties, regularization, and all those things next week. Um, but you know, just to put things a bit into context, um, we'll look at a few, well, maybe not quite so standard kernel algorithms like a simple mean classifier, distribution matching, and so on. Support vector machines are going to be what we will spend most of this lecture on this time. And we'll talk a bit about Gaussian process regression and how it all fits into this context. So you're going to see that all those tools actually fit quite naturally together. And yeah. So without much ado, uh, okay, let me ask, who has heard of kernels yet so far? Okay, good, so most of you, that's great. Um, and I don't know whether I told you already, but many years ago I got an application from somebody to do a PhD with me, and they wrote that they had all this experience with kernels that worked for several years on kernels, and they have managed to get various patches into the kernel. Okay, so, well, this guy was doing Linux, and uh, yeah, he would have been a good programmer. So, um, the usual problem that people motivate the features is um, uh, you have the XOR problem and you want to separate circles from triangles for whatever reason you might want to do that. And of course you can't really do that with a linear classifier in two dimensions. But as soon as I go and lift up the triangles and push down the circles, I can find a nice plane that separates everything. And how would you get this plane? Well, you take X1, X2, then X1, X2. As a matter of fact, it's in that axis that everything becomes nicely separable. Right? So if you know what the solution is, that's easy. But the point is you can actually get that type of a solution by just using a shotgun approach and taking a lot of features and solving it accordingly. So um, basically, the naive non-linearization strategy that, well, actually, sometimes it turns out to be the clever one, but that's a different story is that you express the data in terms of features by a bit, then you solve the problem in features space. 
So that actually turns out to be sometimes the much smarter thing to do in very, very high dimensions. But that's a different story. Um, but this quite often requires explicit feature computation. So we'll get to you know hash kernels and so on, which do that very thing next week. But for the moment, essentially, let's assume that these objects live in you know, maybe a Hilbert space where we can't really look at individual coordinates. So instead, we're going to use the kernel trick. And the trick is basically to write into our algorithm in terms of in the product, then you replace wherever you had x dot x prime by k of x and x dot, which is given by this expression here. And that works really well for these dimension insensitive methods. And well, an obvious thing that you should already see from here is that this matrix k, this kernel matrix, which is given by the entries of in the product, is positive semi-definite. Can somebody tell me why the kernel matrix has to be positive semi-definite? Any maybe, um, but actually it's even simpler than that. So if you think about it, so what we want to do is we want to prove that alpha transposed k alpha is greater or equal than zero. Right. Now this is nothing else than sum over i and j, alpha i, alpha j, in a product phi of x i dot phi of x j. Okay. Now, because that's exactly what k i j is, it's that in a product. Now, there's a reason why I left the space here, because I'm going to move alpha j inside. And nothing untoward happens if I do this. Furthermore, I can also move the alpha i's inside. Furthermore, I can even go and move the sum inside, right? Here, sum of the i's. And there's the sum of the j's. Now, this is the, these are the same vectors. So this is, you know, some norm of some vector in Hilbert space squared, which obviously is greater or equal than zero. And that's how you prove it. Okay, now to put things into a little bit more uh, fancy looking context, here's a cool video that somebody with, I think, a lot of time on his hands generated. So watch this thing, it's going to be another few seconds. Now look at the red and the blue dots that are not separable and wow, now he pulls up all the red dots and now you can get the nice hyperplane which can show up in a few seconds. Wow. And it does separate, right? That's exactly what we want. So somebody clearly had a lot of time to <laughs> make this very nice 3D animation and I'm immensely grateful for that person. And look, here's then the separating hyperplane now in back in two dimensions. Ain't right, that cool? So, let me show you a few kernels that actually will do this trick for you. Well, the first kernel that we already have worked with is the inner product kernel, just x dot x prime. That is trivially a kernel. Right? Because it corresponds to, gives us exactly that inner product matrix. Now, this is usually the example that people use in order to motivate why you want to have features and why those the kernel trick works. So I'm going to show you that. So let's say I want to have you know second order features. So take x1 squared, x2 squared, square root 2x1, x2. And I do that for the x primes as well. So this is my feature extractor for the x primes. And then if I actually do the math, you can you know, by just working out the numbers, and this is why there's a square root 2 to make it all look and work out really nice, it's just x dot x prime squared. Because you'll basically get x1 x1 prime plus x2 x2 prime, the entire expression squared, which is going to go and give you exactly this term, that, and that product. So that's exactly where the square root 2 comes from, is the square root of the coefficient that we have in the phenomenal formula. 
Now, that doesn't only work, you know, for two dimensions. It doesn't only work for an exponent of two. But it works in general. So if I take x dot x prime raised to the power of p, well, that's just going to be, you know, those terms x i x i prime raised to some alpha i times alpha i factorial, and I basically sum over all possible multiple multi indices that have those p terms, right? And since each of those things immediately, you know is an inner product, and I can see that products of inner products are also pro, you know, also correspond to kernels, everything is fine. Okay, actually proving that the product of two matrices is positive semi-definite isn't quite so trivial, right? Maybe we do that for our homework. Yes? So going back to the uh, positive definite. Yes? Uh, so there is nothing special about this mapping function. Well, as a matter of fact, you can show that any positive semi-definite K can be written as, you know, can correspond to an inner product. So, so the way how you do that is by just taking a Kolesky factorization. So I can just write K equals V, V transpose. Right? So these are these just so happen to be triangular matrices, right? And so now my feature map is, you know, essentially those rows of this V matrix. Right. Isn't my question is so there's nothing special about that fact actually here um, that makes it positive. Well what's special is that there is that there exists such a mapping function. So the existence of such a mapping function is special. But I could otherwise just write any symmetric function of two arguments. And so, well, you know, the most, the simplest case would be I just take minus x dot x prime. Yeah. Symmetric, it's, you know, bilinear in this case even, but even though I don't need it, but all the eigenvalues are negative. And there is no feature mapping, at least in the space of reals, that will give you that inner product. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, so actually it's, uh, in this case it's a negative definite term, and uh, in general for arbitrary matrices and in this case corresponding integral operators, you will you know get integral operators that have you know positive and negative eigenvalues, and you can do beautiful math with that. And some people have tried to you know fix things and actually obtain estimators that are still useful even in that indefinite setting. So there's basically a lot of uh, work on, well, not a lot of work, but there are a couple of papers on essential, essentially kernels in crime spaces. And the question then is, you know, which assumptions do you have to actually give away and still obtain something useful? So if you like to see some interesting math, which unfortunately hasn't really made it to complete scalability, you got to look for this thing called crime spaces. So, yeah, we also wrote some papers on that, but the, po the bottom line is it's pretty, but not relevant for large scale problems, because you just can't make it work at scale. In some cases, this is the only thing you have, so you have to make it work, but in general, um, try to stick to positive semi-definite problems if you can. Okay. So here's another one, namely the homogeneous polynomial. And well, what you get there is that basically k of x and x dot is just the original inner product plus some constant raised to the power of p. And then, you know, you just exploit the fact what you know about polynomials, you get those expansion coefficients, and these are original kernels, so if I add them up, if each of the matrices was positive semi-definite, then the sum of those matrices is also positive semi-definite. And that's why it's also a kernel. So, um, yeah, this one we might actually do as an assignment. Um, any questions at the moment? <coughs>
Today the class is very quiet. Yep. Could there be a C term in that bottom Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, there should be a C to the, well, P minus I. Thanks. Great, thanks. You're paying attention, that's good. Um, any other questions? So, that type of kernel tends to work decently well for OCR, for instance. In general, you might want to use something like this, like a Gaussian kernel. So, in case of doubt, if you have no other idea, that's probably a useful thing to use. So you have something like e to the minus gamma the norm of x minus x prime squared. And, well, that's one that sometimes people use for stochastic processes, the Browning bridge. So if x and x prime are greater or equal than zero, you can show that the minimum of x and x prime is also a kernel. Set intersection is also a kernel. As a matter of fact, you can prove this by showing that. But this is a kernel and then picking a special case. And well, there was probably about a decade where in machine learning you could take, you know, your interesting data set with interesting data types and ask, can I write out a kernel for that? And so people have written kernels for pieces of computer programs, graphs, biological sequences, pretty much anything you can think of, images, video, anything you can think of, people have written out a kernel. Yep? How do you determine which one it is to use? Ah, good question. So, in addition to, you know, creating an insane zoo of different kernels, there are also tools to analyze what those various kernels do. So, it's an easy way, an easy thing to think about it as follows. So, for the Gaussian kernel, basically, you know, depending on how I tune this gamma, you know, I might get a narrower or a less narrow kernel function. And well, you can see actually this is a convolution of two Gaussians, so you can immediately see that if I pick a very large gamma, this corresponds to very narrow Gaussians that overlap. And that means that, you know, all the points are essentially orthogonal to each other. So for an arbitrary pair of points, you know, things are essentially orthogonal, which means you need a lot of data to do anything meaningful. Um, whereas if I pick a very small gamma, things get really smeared out. And then basically everything is similar to everything. It may not be very discriminative. Um, so there's tools from regularization theory, and we're going to have a look at some of them next week, where you know you can essentially look at, for instance, the Fourier transform of one of those kernels and check what the spectrum does. If the spectrum decays rapidly, it means it focuses essentially on the low frequency small oscillation type components, whereas the spectrum it, you know, remains essentially flat, it doesn't actually penalize high frequency terms very well. So you may or may not have seen similar things in the context of splines, where you might want to do spline interpolation and you want to make sure that you know the total variation of your function class, for instance, is bounded. That type of tools you can actually make usable then in this context. So for instance, if you have you know any Sobolev spaces or Bezov spaces, then you can quite often find kernels that are useful for those spaces. And yeah, that's essentially where you bring in a lot of your prior knowledge. So if you know what is smooth and what isn't in your you know in your setting, then you're usually in good shape. Okay. So this is really just a preview we'll delve into a lot more detail of that next week. What I want you to understand for the moment is simply, basically wherever we had an inner product, we can now just plug in a kernel. And if I manage to get through with that throughout, and I never really require knowledge of the actual coefficients of my parameter vector, then I can kernelize my algorithm. And I said there was probably a decade during which this was an extremely productive thing to do academically and also in terms of you know, designing useful algorithms and doing startups and all that. Um, so let's look at SVMs. So I saw this, well, slightly bizarre cartoon, which, yeah, basically it's a large margin separator. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> 
uh, which I think is much more memorable than this. This is probably one of the oldest graphs that Vanashokov made in this context. It must be at least 15 years old, and the fonts and everything is really off because it was done on an old SGI. I think I'm just showing it for nostalgia's sake. Um, yeah. Basically, here's what happens. I mean, we've already seen that before. We have that support vector classification problem. And I try to convince you that this is the margin, right? And then we minimize yeah, so this is the margin. We minimize basically the inverse margin squared under the constraint that I want to have, you know, a decent amount of separation. Now, we've probably already also already seen the dual problem of that, and that was this piece here. So we, we minimize with respect to alpha, one half alpha transpose k alpha minus, you know, sum over all the alpha i's, under the constraint that all the alpha i's are balanced. And alpha i greater equal to zero, and this is our kernel matrix. Okay? And that's the correct problem. Um, does somebody have any questions about how you would actually derive this equation? So I think we did it last time. So the interesting thing about this is the following. So remember the Karras Kontaka conditions, right? They say it's well, <coughs> dual variable times constraint equals zero. Now, what it means is that as soon as I know that this is actually strictly greater than one, I know that alpha i must be zero. Furthermore, I know that if alpha i is greater than zero, this condition here must be zero. So actually, this should be a minus one here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just cut and paste in the max. Um, yeah. So, but basically, what it what it implies is that only those points on the boundary can have non-zero support vectors. As soon as I'm away from the boundary, there's no way any of those alpha i's can be zero, can, can be non-zero. Furthermore, if I know that any of the alpha i's is non-zero, I know this point must lie on the boundary. There's an interesting case that it doesn't catch, which is when both terms are zero. So knowing that the alpha i is, that the coefficient is zero, does not imply that it's off the boundary. It does imply that, you know, with, insofar as, you know, that's only a set of major zero, uh, you know, that basically, you know, if you guess that it's off the boundary, it's a really good guess and you, you're going to be right at the limit, but it does not strictly imply that in terms of the optimization problem. But in practice, you can pretty much assume it. The interesting thing is, this weight vector w is actually a weighted linear combination of instances. Right? And only the points really on the margin matter. As a matter of fact, I could have thrown out all the other points and gotten the same problem. You can see that immediately just by looking at the optimization problem here. If you think about, you know, I want to find the largest separator, then whatever those points over here are doing doesn't really matter in terms of how much I can expand this slab. Right? So if I have a constraint optimization problem and some constraints are inactive, I know that I can drop the inactive constraints and get the same problem back, as in the same solution. And the nice thing is inner products are the only ones that matter. So we get a quadratic program. We can replace this inner product by a kernel. So it's actually kind of scary what happened. So that original insight that we can just, you know, kernelize. We have yi, yj, xi, xj. And this was kernelized to, well, yi, yj, k of xi and xj. Right. And that was around 1992. That's the Bozogia and Vatnik paper. 
Now, then it took another 12 years till around 2004. There were some precursors of that. So the in interesting things started happening around 2000, 2004. But the paper that really nailed it was the paper by Tuscar, Gestrin, and Collar, which essentially moved from here to saying, well, hey, actually, this is also a kernel. We can just throw everything into one kernel. I'm just abbreviating things here a little bit, but we'll get to that in more detail. K of xi, yi, xi prime, yi prime, in the context of structural estimation. Where now those yi's are essentially first class citizens in terms of, you know, that they can be structured, they can have, you know, all sorts of interesting attributes, and have performed joint estimation over that. So if you look at that, I mean, you know, it, it, it looks trivial. And anybody can do that. Right? So I just wonder how many other things there are where, in hindsight, it looks really simple to go from here to there to there. But each of those papers was essentially a blockbuster paper. Okay, if you want to play with that, that's a Java demo that works sort of. Yeah. Okay, so here are some points, and you can get a nice linear separation. I've colored the support vectors because, well, they are probably not very well visible otherwise in the back. But that's basically the margin of separation, and whoever did the contour plots didn't do it very well. Yeah. Uh, now, why would you actually care about the large margin, right? Well, one way to think about it is it gives us maximum robustness relative to uncertainty. On top of that, we get rid of various symmetries because, you know, is this hyperplane better than that one or better than, you know, another one here? You know, you've got to have at least one rule to decide which one's better than the other. And, yeah. The, the nice thing is that it's independent of correctly classified instances. What that means is that it gives me a drastic data set reduction, which also explains why the first SVM experiments were done with optical character recognition. So if you think about OCR, you expect very, very high accuracy. So the error rates, you know, should be in the 1% range. And even that would be still quite frustrating, and then you do other things with it. Now, if you want that, then, well, the good thing is that there are going to be also on your training data, preferably only very few errors or points that sit exactly on the margin. What that means is that out of the total number of constraints, which, you know, in 1995, machines with 32 gigabytes were huge, right? So if you have a data set of 60,000 images, then training that on 32 me sorry, megabytes, not gigabytes. So 32 megabytes machines were huge in 95. So if you want to train a 60,000 image data set on that, your machine was actually quite busy. And that means that if you could get rid of most of the data set and only work essentially on one or 2% of the data, that was a really good thing to do. Because basically you could maybe hold around a thousand support vectors in memory, and then you will get the kernel matrix, which would be maybe a thousand by a thousand, which will cost you between four and eight megabytes, right? Four megabytes in float and eight megabytes in double. So things were actually workable. And that explains why there are so many early SVM papers that do, that deal with, uh, you know, optical character recognition. And um, yeah basically large margin, it quantifies, you know, how easy the problem is actually to solve. Now, that robustness idea, you can actually push a little bit further. So there's a paper by Chris Bishop about training with input, uh, with uh, noise on the instances. So we basically take your instances and you add a little bit of noise to it and you want to make sure that the estimator still works well, even if you make your data a little bit more noisy. And he shows that this corresponds to regularization. And to tie the loop, you can prove 
but this also corresponds to regularization, and so you have that entire connection between robustness, optimization, regularization, and then you know, kernels. Now, if I do this, however, there's a problem, right? Because if I have even just a single instance that is not correctly classified, well, my shiny linear separator isn't going to be able to solve that, right? So there is no linear separator that I can actually deal with this. And that remained an open problem in the support vector world until 1995 in the paper by Portis and Buckney. I'm going to show you the modification in a moment because again, it's basically adding two symbols to the optimization problem. A minus and a, and a slack variable sign. That's really all that you're changing. That's the original problem. And here it's just minus sign in the constraint. And then you add it into the metric. That simple modification. So the generalized portrait algorithm of Wapnik and Lerner is from 1965. It took until 2005 for this small modification. Oh, sorry, 1995 for this small modification. Still 30 years. Now, in the L1 programming literature, that had been known about three, four years before by a paper of Bennett and Mangazari. introduced the slack trick and then Cortes and Wapnik graded and applied it to SVMs. And probably this was an old trick even in that context already at the time. I don't know. So, a useful thing to see in this case is that the problem now is always feasible regardless of what the data looks like. And that's a really useful thing because if the problem remains feasible, it will, the dual solution will always remain bounded. And I'm going to actually derive that problem for you guys now. Um, any questions so far at the moment? Yep? In the last slide you said something about the, the uh, symmetry breaks. Could you yes. illustrate that? Me? Okay. So with symmetry breaking, I mean that I have a lot of arbitrary solutions, right? And I want to add essentially a device which picks one of, out of all of the many. So you basically need to have a mechanism to, to decide which one from a large set you pick and, and do it in such a way that's actually reproducible and computationally attractive. Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to derive the dual of this quadratic program And this might be a good exercise for your assignment anyway. Let's just look at the optimization problem. We have 1 of w squared plus d times c psi r. Okay. So we're going to construct our Lagrange function. Now we need to add to that all our constraints. So we have alpha i times. Let's just make sure we get things right. So we have 1 minus psi i minus the centile beast here minus w dot xi minus b. And that is multiplied with why only? Do we have that here? Yeah. Okay. Good. And then we have another term, right? We have those psi i's that need to be greater or equal than zero. So we get minus eta i psi i. Okay. So now we need to check 
that the derivatives are all zero. So dW of L. That's, well, easy, W. Now, that term doesn't depend on W. This term here, well, does, right? We have basically minus alpha i sub xi. That's it. So W minus sub over i alpha i, well, actually yi xi equals zero. So from that immediately it follows that W is sum over I, alpha I, Y I, X I. Now the next thing we do is we take the derivative with respect to B. Okay, that doesn't depend on B, that doesn't, that's the only place where it occurs. And here we have basically sum over alpha I, Y I equals zero. Here, minus alpha i, y i equals zero. Okay, fine. So that's easy. Then we need to take a derivative with respect to the size. And that is C minus alpha i. And then we have minus eta. And furthermore, I also know that the alpha i's have to be greater or equal than zero because they're dual variables. The same thing applies to the etas. Okay. So now we're almost home. what we need to do is, we now need to plug that back in. So this term here will eliminate that, that, and that term. Okay. This expression here will eliminate this. This expression here is going to lead to a minus one half here, and it will make this term here go away. Okay. So now we're almost done, right? We basically get. minus one half norm of W squared plus and here we have basically sum over I alpha I. Right. That's what happens if we plug all this back in. Furthermore, we can actually get our hand and if we then plug the expansion for W in here, we get exactly that dual problem, right? <coughs> now, last but not least, we need to take care of this constraint. Because it basically means that alpha i plus eta i equals c. Now that's equivalent, because this, these etas don't really do anything, so I can immediately get rid of them. See, they don't even show up in the objective anymore. They're just another slack variable. It just means that the alpha i's are in the interval between 0 and c. Okay. And so we have this constraint. We have this constraint. We have this condition. 
and then our objectives given by that term. And now we can solve things even with errors. Any questions? Yep. Like we reduce the slash variables with because the hyperplane already is separable. I mean, we don't find hyperplane yes. separate the data. But, right. but if you're using the color, like, and if you go to sufficiently high dimension, then one could essentially. Excellent question. Excellent question. And what you're saying right now is essentially the hand wavy argument that they made in the paper from 1992, the Bozogurdov paper, where they said, well, you know, we don't really need so much that we are able to separate everything perfectly because, you know, kernel magic works its ways and everything is good. But that's not a very good thing to do because it effectively tries to, tries as hard as, as possible to separate even data when it's, you know, really noisy when they're outliers. So, you really want to have that second knob to control the solution com com the complexity by actually allowing for individual instances to become, you know, misclassified. That's that to um, it actually combats overfitting. No, so if you don't have exact variables. If you don't have stack variables, you may actually end up with overfitting. Because what, what happens in terms of robustness is actually that the instance with uh, misclassified instances can completely, you know, screw up your, your linear separator. So this is not a good thing. And that's why you need this. Okay. And no surprise, if I now misclassify something, yes, okay, the hyperplane changed a bit, but that's it. Now to see a little bit what happens in terms of the interplay between regularization constant and function class. So, you know, if I, you know, crank up the weight that I'm associating with, you know, a violation of the hyperplane, then I will, you know, get increasingly nonlinear functions and, you know, in case I don't regularize very much, I mean, the best thing that, you know, a classifier can do is to try and pick something that's very straight. And a lot of points will be here within the margin on both sides. So there's this dotted line, which you probably can't see in the back, but if you squint at your slides afterwards, you'll see it. And these points are, you know, misclassified. Now if I, you know, enforce the large margin of separation a bit more, I'll see that, you know, this actually does a pretty decent job, and these two points here are still misclassified. As I crank it up even more, I will I can see that okay now they actually are correctly classified, but that might almost be overfitting. So an important thing to take from that is that the margin of separation, while it's linear in high dimensional space, need not be linear in the low dimensional space. So it does not need to be linear, it does not need to be contiguous or connected to anything. But we already saw that in the beautiful video where, you know, things in high dimensional space were a nice hyperplane cut, and then in low dimensional space it was just, you know, some ellipsoid. Yep? So in my experience, the classification I just is piling on left magic associated with normalizing the features. What's your view on normalizing? Okay. Length and they stack features into matrix and all each each dimension. Okay, so okay, so the, so the question was that essentially, you know, should we is it important to normalize data? Of course it is. That's good engineering. Uh, basically if you have, you know, maybe somebody's weight measured in milligrams and then his height measured in kilometers, and I try building a linear model that's not going to be very good. At least it will require a lot of data to get around the very bizarre scale. Now, uh, decision trees, for instance, sometimes people advertise them <coughs> for being, you know, impervious to such problems because, you know, I can rescale my data in any way as long as it's monotonic, everything's fine. As a matter of fact, you can get the very same thing too for SVMs. All you do is you apply the probability integral transform. So the probability integral transform basically just, if I have the 
cumulative distribution function f of x, then I map x into f inverse of x. So in other words, if my instance is at the 90th quantile, then the feature is going to be 0.9. This makes all the problems completely impervious to monotonic transforms on the coordinates and it works decently well. So this is then very close to what a decision tree could do. Now in some cases coordinates actually carry meaning. For instance if I have a computer vision problem then the individual pixels are probably actually very meaningful. So finding good pre-processing, finding you know good feature representations and you know, transformations is the thing that if you need to solve a very specific problem you really have to do. But you know, this is essentially where you need to talk with the domain experts and the engineers to actually solve it. What SVMs can do is they can make it easier for you to find such transformations and they make it easier for you not to miss anything that's really important. But of course if you rescale it's better. Now there are automatic ways how to do this. There's for instance this thing called automatic relevance determination. And there are also all sorts of papers on learning the kernel, which now had a brief renaissance uh, where people again are starting to write papers on how to learn the kernel. Ten years ago they did that too. Um, it's a new generation of PhD students basically. Um, but yeah, so there are ways to tune. Questions? Um, okay, so let's quickly have a look at the loss function point of view. So, if you recall our optimization from right, that was basically what we had. We had, you know, minimize 1 half w squared plus c times sum of psi i, subject to those constraints. Then, as a matter of fact, you can actually solve for psi i. Because you basically know the psi i's have to be greater equal than zero, and they better be as small as possible. So I basically take the minimum between, you know, one minus this and zero. So the maximum between one minus that and zero, right? And I plug it back in here. Now I have a loss function. That insight took about seven years. Right. It's completely obvious and straightforward in hindsight. But inside it took about yeah, seven, eight years until people really started exploiting that fact for practical algorithms. So sometimes science moves insanely slowly, even though there's a flurry of papers. But once you do this, you can ask the question, you know, is this soft margin really the right loss? Well, to some extent it is, right? This is, after all, the misclassification loss we want to minimize. But that's a really nasty loss to minimize. So an upper bound is you know, this function here. So convex upper bound. Um, could I pick a different loss function? Heck yes, of course I could. So here's our binary loss again. I could have something like the logistic loss, which is this blue curve. I could have what I would call the Huberized loss, which is, you know, essentially like the soft margin loss, but it has a small quadratic part in here. So it's a little bit easier to optimize. So when you optimize, basically, if you're in this regime here, your optimizer knows whether you're making progress or not. That's basically why this function here that's, you know, linear and quadratic, and then linear again, uh, is sometimes a little bit better. So if you use VW, the rate function is what's implemented. And you could probably, you know, pick half a dozen other functions. You could rather than logic, you could have a probit or, you know, basically anything that any self-respecting statistician will do. Um, yeah. So let's actually look at that from the viewpoint of risk minimization again. So at some point our goal might be we want to find some function f which minimizes, you know, the, the true classification error. So that means in expectation, if I draw a pair as x and y from my joint distribution of x and y, they want to make sure that the probability that, well, y times f of x 
is greater than zero, that's as large as possible. So that's where you're getting that. Well, actually, I should have written here less than zero, and then it's actually a cost, but I guess you get the idea. Now, of course, I don't really have access to the true distribution. Everything would be fine if I did. I only have access to an empirical average. So I draw from this distribution some x and y pairs, so I can evaluate. Now, maximizing this term is non convex. And furthermore, we actually would get overfitting if we wanted to minimize the empirical error. As a matter of fact, you can show that this problem here is NPR for linear separators. And that's pretty much what killed neural networks and the perceptron in the 70s, basically the Minsky and Patrick book. They show that you know, finding a minimum, minimum error, linear separators can be hard. And so therefore, the argument was, you know, it's hopeless. You don't have to even try. Don't bother. And people stopped actually working on these problems because, well, they read the paper and they read that, you know, finding a minimum error linear, linear separator is unbelievably hard. So, you know, anything you can only do is heuristics. And no self-respecting computer scientist would ever do heuristics, right? Until a little bit later, people started rereading what the theorem actually said. Right? The theorem said, yes, finding a minimum error linear separator is hard. But it doesn't say anything about, you know, finding upper bounds, you know, exactly proving anything about, you know, in which cases these upper bounds are good, and so on and so on, or proving consistency for the upper bounds. So it's basically by, you know, not looking at the conditions of the theorem properly, and then coming to improper conclusions, what screwed up the field for quite a while. Anyway, so non-convex problem, we will overfit. So what we do is, first of all, to deal with non-convexity, we take a convex upper bound on the loss. And then, the other thing is we add this regularization term for complexity control. So this is basically a function on this function f, which is large if, if f is complicated and small if it's simple. And the norm of w squared turns out to be a really useful thing to do. I think we've probably deserved a short break here. Um, and